So let's see if we can get the SD card working and then we can call this finished. So over here I have the machine running Emutos with the lid off, as is fairly obvious. I have a card in each slot. This one has got the Parmos card in it and this one has the Emutos card in it. Over here I have a logic probe which will light up a LED depending whether it sees a logic zero, a logic one, or if there's any activity. So we've got here a pinout for the SD card. So we should be able to see this one is chip select and is currently at logic one, which means it's not asserted. This is active low. Here we've got mozzie, which is data, no activity, as we expect. Uh, ground is logic zero, is ground. VCC power is 3.3 .3 volts, which is logic one. Clock, no activity. Ground, again. Um, MISO, master in, slave out, uh, no activity. And the last one is not used in SPI mode. So, what we're going to do is to poke the card and see what if there's any activity on the lines. What's almost certainly happened is that Parmos has set up the hardware in a weird state, which my initialization code is failing to correct. So it's likely to be something as simple as the clock's wrong or the pins aren't wired up to the uh, GPIOs properly or and stuff like that. So what we're going to do is just poke the card by doing DIRs while looking at the various data lines and seeing what happens. Now, the first thing to test is whether the card is powered on. So we've got chip select, which is here. We expect that to be unasserted. Logic one means unasserted, so that's correct. Mozzie, no activity. Ground is at zero, that is ground. Uh, VCC is at one. Good, this means the card is powered on. And clock, no activity. Uh, ground again is ground. And MISO, no activity. So that's pretty good. For a start, it means the card is actually powered on. So the next thing I suppose is let's see what chip select does. So touch this to the chip select line DIR and return. Okay, uh, the blinking means that chip select is going high and low. So we know that the chip select is being strobed, which is correct. Right. Mozzie for activity. Master out, slave in. This is the board talking to the card. Is it sending it commands? Yes, it is. Good. Or rather, not so good, because I was kind of hoping that one of these things would be wrong, because that would be an easy fix. Uh, clock is uh, seven six five. This one, so logic zero. We see activity. Clock is being strobed. Uh, ground miso master in slave out. This is the card talking to the board. The card is not responding. OK. So either it's not wired up or we're sending some kind of incorrect data and the card is not recognizing it. So I think I figured out what's going on. Now, here it is. And you notice the card is not working. And I've discovered that if I unplug the Parmos card, it all works. So let's take a look at these lines. 
So we have power on pin four, two, three, four. This card is powered up. This card is also powered up. Chip select on pin one. Deasserted. Asserted? Hmm. Uh, so let me see. Mozzie is on pin two. Yeah. So that's this one. So we do a DIR. Make sure. And you get activity. Do a DIR. You get activity. Right, what is happening is that both cards are being selected at the same time, which means that when we send commands to the first card, the both cards respond at the same time and we get garbage. So this ought to be a relatively easy fix. Uh, we just need to make sure that firstly that both cards are powered down and I forgot to make a note of what pins these were on port B Right, we're going to have to figure out what pins card zero are on. Uh, card one is on. Uh, the other thing is that we want to make sure that the chip select line for card one, this one, is de-asserted. It is asserted more or less by accident. In fact, we could have this card powered up, but deasserted and everything will be fine. Um, but let's just keep them powered off. Okay, I'm going to have to fire up Gidra. Okay, here it is. So we want SPI power, SPI power reset. What's this? Read, request, set. Here we go. So let's just make things a bit more visible. That's a thunk. Here is the code. Um, bus awake should be actually doing. Yeah, here we go. Here it is fiddling with the bits, the pins. Um, No, it's not. This is the uh, the ST microcontroller stuff. I think. Yeah. All right. Let's try this the other way. Uh, we know that the power line is on port B. So go. Let's go look for. Come on. Uh, PB cell. Where is this used by? It apparently is used by this routine. Yes, I had misread this. So the last thing it does is it powers up the card using PB and it is bit five. So let's assume that for the other device, it's the same. This is on port K and it is bit five. So bit five, SD card one power. Let's 
So, so this is all exactly the same. PK, Ewan, and I'm assuming that the other card is set up the same way with the same transistor controlling the power. All right, power on card zero only, but that's fine. So, assertion, we know that this is on PJ bit three. Did we remember to write that down? We did not. SD card zero assert, uh, chip select. So over here, this should be touching port J, which is here. It is setting not the bit. I, oh, yeah, that is the right bit. And oh, this is the same chip select line that the SPI interface actually wants to be connected to. They're using that GPIO for chip select, which presumably makes the wiring easier or something. So the same code here is in pin port F. Uh, bit two. So port F bit two for the value four is SD card one chip select. Uh, so this is actually let's see, power off both cards. Set up CS GPIOs and D assert both cards. So this is conf this is concerned only with this bit. So that will be F F F F. Uh, three. Okay. Uh, this will leave the other pins unaffected. So, so we're going to do it in two passes so that this code uh, configures the chip select line and sets it this code configures the SPI lines. So this is going now going to be port F. And it's uh, this is going to be uh, one zero one one, which is a D. Yes. Now, the this code is also fiddling with some stuff in port D that I reckon... Oh yeah, port D is the interrupt. 
uh, port. So uh, value of two is this. So that's going to be SD card zero interrupt. And the same thing here is the next bit up, SD card one IRQ, but we're not using those. All right, so assuming I haven't cocked something up here, I think this ought to work. We don't have Definition for P K P U N four two four four two or P F Four two eight Okay. Fix that warning. Invalid operands to binary star have int and what is wrong with that? Oh, it's this one. Here we go. See, sometimes uses really ridiculous error messages. Okay. Let's give this a try and see if it works. And unfortunately, this will require turning the board upside down again. Okay, here we go. So Dana run, we just start up the serial terminal, go. Bingo, it works. And here we are at Atari TOS. Um, I haven't calibrated the, the touch screen, so. And now, where did I put the stylus? I appear to have slightly lost it. It'll be on my desk somewhere. So let's just use the stylus from my very expensive work issue Pixelbook 3, which is terrible. Okay. How's this behaving? Poorly. Anyway. That seems to be working now, and it seems to be noticeably snappier than than it was previously. All 
All right, so let's. Um, I've got here a benchmark program. Um, here we go, run me. This is core mark that is fairly well respected. There's a lookup table of Atari ST values. It takes a little while to run, but uh, I will either fast forward, keep talking, or jump cut. Um, I believe this is now running at uh, twice the clock speed. There we go. Uh, return. Twice the clock speed that it was. 5.5 iterations per second. I remember that was what it was doing last time. Let me just go look this up. So a value of 5.5 is in fact the same value I was getting before. This puts this machine on a par with a 16 megahertz Falcon or a whatever that is. Uh, in terms of modern processors, it comes in between a uh, an Atmel 80 mega and an MSP430, which are both system on a chip, ultra cheap, tiny little processors running at eight megahertz. So clearly this the 68,000 is not that quick. Uh, interestingly, this is the same speed as it was before. It just feels snappier when I'm using it. So, hmm. It's possible Parmos has configured some stuff that I don't know how to that makes things like the graphics better. I'm not sure. Uh, also, because I fiddled with these numbers, the SD card is now running twice as fast as it was previously. That will make anything... No, wait, that, that's wrong. That's running half as fast as it was previously. So I think I actually want to put these back to where they were. Which is for actual data transfer as fast as possible, which isn't very fast, but the the clock rate used for identifying the SD card does need to be at about 250 kilohertz or else it won't work. So let's just build and deploy that and make sure it still works. And a interesting little quirk, which is that after resetting, the Dana has now come up with its uh, calibration screen. This is because uh, Parmos is expecting the RAM to be preserved between boots. And of course, every time I run Parmos, it scribbles over the RAM. Is it going to calibrate this time? No, it's not. So we hit the reset button, hopefully it should skip the calibration. So clearly when I ran CoreMark, it, it overwrote some of the magic numbers that let Parmos know whether the RAM is consistent. So it went through the full reset procedure. Currently I actually have this set to only use 4 megabytes of RAM because my reset script only seems to produce that much available. I think I could probably... here we go. I think I could probably bump that to 8 meg if we're running from Parmos because Parmos has configured it. And of course, now that it's reset, I don't have Dana run anymore. So we have to resync it via USB. Like so. And it's shown up. So Serial terminal, go. And, yep, the SD card now works. Good. It's done. I mean, there's a million bugs to fix. 
well, some bugs to fix. And tracing I need to remove. But let's just turn the SD card tracing off. Uh, actually, let's just okay. push and done. So here I have the Dana on the workbench so that you can get a better look at it because now I can use like a real camera. Uh, so here we are at Parmos. If I run it by running the Dana run program, it boots the kernel and we get the splash screen and we end up we're at the gem desktop. I now need to run the calibration tool and the easiest way to do that is via the command line. So I'll do control Z, uh, Dana Cal. This is still the, oops, I touched twice. This is still the version with all the debug messages in it. So I have to run that again. Okay. So exit back to gem and see whether the mouse pointer is even slightly accurate. Well, that's okay over there. And you can see it drifts way right over there and going up and down makes it move diagonally. And over here, it's doing the horrible backwards motion thing. But in the middle, it's all right and I can I should be able to open menus. It's not very effective. There we go. So it does actually kind of work. And menu opening and closing is good and snappy, as you can see. It's, uh, no, I don't want to do anything there. Cancel. There we go. Uh, it's for a, a for a Quasi Atari ST, it is perfectly acceptable performance-wise. Disk's a bit slow. Uh, if I go hunting for software, I actually installed a bunch of Atari ST software on this, including things like Cubase and various drawing packages uh, and Lisp. Uh, and nearly all of them don't work. The issue is that either they expect a bigger screen because this is only 560 by 160, which is shorter than a Atari ST screen. Um, and it's shorter than an Atari ST low res screen and narrower than Atari ST uh, 80 column screen. Uh, and the stuff that does accept the screen size tends not to work because it talks directly to the hardware like Cubase. But I did find First Word Plus here that runs. So let's go and find that. Um, here we go. Can I run it by double clicking? Nah, there's too much noise in the motion of the, uh, the mouse. So we can at least select it and I can do Control O to open it. Uh, First Word Plus is a basic word processor that I believe got bundled with a lot of Atari STs. It's actually not bad. I did a lot of writing in the, uh, in the Archimedes port of it. It's a character cell word processor and I like these. Um, I actually wrote my own uh, character cell word processor because I like these so much. But it's decent, it's nice and, uh, nice and nippy. The cursor movement is a bit slow sometimes. I believe that's a bug in the um, keyboard driver. It also double presses a lot of the times, which is annoying. But uh, 
Speed isn't bad. Yeah. Now, you may notice that uh, the window here is bigger than the screen size because this has been sized for a probably 640 by 200 uh, Atari monochrome display. Unfortunately, uh, this has put the resize buttons over here somewhere where I can't get at them. I can, with a great deal of difficulty, come on, drag the window around, there you go, except it won't let me drag it off the left hand side of the screen so I can't get at the controls which is somewhat irritating so I just have to live with it being the wrong size. That did not work. Okay, well it's not, it's nearly on the left hand side of the screen. Come on. No, that wasn't what I wanted. There we go. So you can actually put the cursor off the bottom, but redraw speed is all right. Uh, it, it keeps up with my typing most of the time. Uh, the, it feels a bit laggy to use because of the keyboard issue. I mean, you can see the the way the cursor is moving. I'm just holding down the cursor key. And uh, one interesting aspect is if I use the keyboard mouse, which is done with the Alt key, if you do Alt right, you can see the mouse pointer is moving in jerks, but the cursor is also moving, which means that sometimes it's misinterpreting keys because it doesn't think that Alt is down. That is solely a bug in my code, which is, like, annoying. Uh, oh, yeah, just to demonstrate that it will work, I installed a desktop accessory, which is this calculator. These are Terminate and Stay Resident programs that get loaded at boot time. And you can use them to provide little utilities that they live in this left-hand menu here which is, apparently has an Atari icon on it when it's in, in First Word Plus. In the desktop, it's just labeled desk. And it's a, you know, perfectly ordinary basic calculator. Ah, which apparently does not. Okay, that works. Yeah, it's a perfectly ordinary calculator. Uh, you notice that the menu, uh, the title bar is slightly off the top of the screen. Again, that is a issue with the screen size. You see how the window doesn't quite fit. Now, if I can manage to drag this. Come on. There we go. See, it has truncated the title bar because it's, it's moved the window by just blitting it around in the video memory and hasn't redrawn that bit. Um, you can trigger it to redraw and it will show up again. It's just cosmetically annoying. Oh yeah, another small issue is that while the menus work, you can see how fast they open and close. The, the contents of the screen underneath the menu is cached in memory, which is nice. Uh, ah, I can't get it help, never mind. Help overflows the right hand side of the screen and wraps around to the left hand side of the screen, which is not brilliant. Again, on a machine with a bigger screen, this shouldn't be an issue because First Word Plus thinks the screen is the wrong size, which is annoying. Uh, yeah, First Word Plus has stuff like graphics in it. It's reasonably well. Um, well provisioned as word processors go. If the other bugs were fixed, then I could see myself actually using this thing with First Word Plus. It's a decent enough little word processor. But 
as it is, I'm afraid, after playing with it for a while, it's too buggy to be of much use. Things like the keyboard. The biggest issue is there is no power control and this machine doesn't have an on-off switch. It's always powered up. I have this thing plugged in via USB uh, and there's no battery in it. Plug it in, it turns on. Because, of course, it was intended to run PalmOS, which keeps all its data in RAM, which means if it powers down, you lose all your data, hence on all the time. What it's got instead is power down modes, and the power controller and the battery management, is just nothing there. I haven't bothered with any of that. Battery management is a little bit tricky, because if you get it wrong, you can do bad things, like, you know, set fire to stuff. So, uh... If there's interest, I shall just wait for somebody else to be interested enough to work on that, I think. Uh, anyway, let's quit out of this. Oh, yeah, the LQ. No. The keyboard shortcuts aren't listed in the menus, which is annoying. I don't know what they are in that of the manual. Come on. All the way to quit. There we go. And quit all. And no, I don't care about that document. And that takes us back to Gem. Uh, the command line environment is perfectly usable and pretty snappy. It understands the screen size. So uh, command line tools will probably work fine on this. If I manage to get all the memory working, this machine has, I believe, 16 megabytes of RAM. So that's a pretty well-specced Atari ST. Uh, and there's a whole suite of command line tools available, including Mint, which is basically a series of massive TOS extensions that turn your Atari ST into a basic Unix machine with multitasking sockets and you know the born shell and so on and mint does run on it on uh, emutos so it would be quite possible to do a mint port to the dana again uh, gui applications are still like intended for ordinary atari tos gem and you still have the same screen problems but the command line environment would be perfectly usable Anyway, I am going to call this project finished. I think it has been rather too many episodes. And besides, I'm going away on holiday soon and won't be able to work on it. So I'm going to do some tidying, upload it all to GitHub and send off a pull request to the Emutos people and leave it at that. I know there's been people who have actually been watching these for some reason. I hope you all enjoyed it. I'm going to work on other programming stuff in the future, but I'm going to take a good long break first, so there should be some more workbench stuff. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and all the rest in the series. Please let me know what you think in the comments.